Thank you all for your attendance and for sticking with us to the last panel. This panel is focused on campaign finance and the future of political parties. For those of you who are just joining us, we have a note card system. So if you are interested in asking our panelists a question, simply raise your hand in the air. Someone will be around with a note card. Um, you can write your question on the note card, um, raise it back up in the air, and someone will come grab it, and then we will uh, try to get to as many questions, but not all, as possible. My name is Nicholas Hall, and I am a second year law student and Toll Public Interest Scholar here, and am very excited to introduce our panelists here today to talk about campaign finance and its role in the evolving nature of political parties. We have four esteemed panelists with us here today. To my right, we have Ian Vandy Walker, who serves as counsel for the Brennan Center's Democracy Program, where he works on voting rights and campaign finance reform. His work has been featured in press outlets across the nation, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, NPR, MSNBC, Newsweek, and the Los Angeles Times. Next, we have Rebecca Ballhaus, who is a reporter at the Wall Street <coughs> Journal's Washington, D.C. Bureau, where she writes about national politics, campaign finance, and lobbying. During the most recent 2016 campaign, she covered every aspect of the candidate's fundraising and spending reporting on Donald Trump's payments to his family-owned businesses, Hillary Clinton's overlaps with her foundation as Secretary of State, and corporate leaders' political giving. Next, we have Mr. Kedrick Payne. He is a Penn Law alum and serves as an adjunct professor in the field of government ethics, lobbying law, and election law. Mr. Payne was the Deputy Chief Counsel of the Office of Congressional Ethics, where he investigated ethics violations of members of Congress. He now serves as Deputy General Counsel for Environment and Compliance for the U.S. Department of Energy. And finally, we have Mr. Jason Abel, who is of counsel at Steptoe and Johnson in Washington, D.C. From 2009 to 2011, he served as Chief Counsel for Chair Chairman Senator Chuck Schumer, the U.S. Senate Committee on Rules and Administration, and for two years prior as Counsel for Senator Schumer in his personal office. During his time on the Hill, he served as the lead Senate aide for campaign finance issues, including the Disclose Act, which was the Democratic response to the Supreme Court's opinion in Citizens United v. FEC. So, to get started, I'd like to pose this to you, In What is campaign finance, and is it a partisan issue? Uh, okay, uh, so in, in today's America, anytime anybody asks you if something's a partisan issue, the easy answer is yes. Um, I mean, I think if you ask elected officials, you'll hear very different answers on different sides of the aisle. However, if you ask the American people, you know, polls show that uh, huge majorities, no, nothing polls as well as is campaign finance a problem uh, across Democrats and Republicans and independents. Um, so the way that politicians and would-be politicians pay for their campaigns um, has actually changed radically in the last decade. Um, you know, we need, people need money to pay for campaigns and they get it from private donations. Um, we used to have a system of disclosure and contribution limits <laughs> Uh, where you know you couldn't give above a certain amount and everything was disclosed. That system has been radically weakened, uh, most notably by the Supreme Court and Citizens United, um, but also by um, a sort of failure to regulate in Congress and the FEC. And then, of course, each state has its own systems. Um, you know, the Brennan Center. We did a study looking at where does the money come from in the federal campaign finance system. Uh, and how has that changed over time? And we found that if you look at individual contributions to politicians, parties, PACs, uh, including super PACs, in the 90s, more than half of the money came from small donors across the whole system. And that amount has steadily decreased over the past few decades. Um, and some, uh, contrary wise, in, in the 90s, the amount of money from what we call mega donors, which means people who give $100,000 or more, uh, which is, I will disclose more than I make in a year, um, ha, you know, used to be around five, six percent in the, in the Citizens United world. We're now up to uh, 23 plus percent. So almost one out of every four dollars in the system 
has come from someone who gives multiple times what the median American income is, you know, in a single check, just like, here you go. Um, so, you know, in a democracy, the representative, our representatives are supposed to represent us, where the us is the whole polity, the whole electorate. And the worry is that the campaign finance system being funded so disproportionately by the 1% of the 1% who can afford these large checks means that the government is disproportionately responsive to their needs as opposed to um, what everybody else needs and what everybody else wants. And I think everybody, so, uh, so is it a partisan issue? In some sense, everybody recognizes this is a problem. This is a problem for your political priorities, whether they are on the left, things like climate change uh, and you know, consumer rights, or uh, you have priorities on the right about you know, not having crony capitalism and things like that. Um, so I definitely think it's, it's sort of a problem for everyone. Um, and that there are solutions that we should all be able to agree on, which I hope, hope to talk about later in the panel. <clears throat> Next, I want to turn to Rebecca. And Ian mentioned a little bit about the history of um, campaign finance. What just happened in 2016? Was it an anomaly? Could you tell us a little bit about what exactly happened in the world of campaign finance um, in the presidential election? Sure. So I think what we saw in many respects in this past election was a big departure from past campaigns. Um, campaign finance was only one of the ways in which things changed. But Donald Trump spent far less than his rivals and certainly far less than past nominees on TV ads. He also spent much less on things like ground game and voter outreach especially during the primary uh, before he got the support of the Republican National Committee. Um, you also saw for the first time in, I, I think, several decades, uh, big business and Fortune 100 CEOs almost universally supported the Democrat over the Republican, which is uh, pretty unusual. Uh, and a lot of the top industries that gave to Mitt Romney in 2012, like oil and gas and lawyers and lobbyists and Wall Street, this time supported Clinton instead. But I think in some ways, I don't think that this means that now everything's going to be different going forward. I think that Trump was in many ways an anomaly, uh, first of all, because he was so well known going into things. Also, his penchant for making controversial remarks and calling into cable TV stations meant he got, I think it ended up being something like $3 billion worth of free media by the end of the campaign. So I think those two factors, combined with the fact that over the course of the campaign, you saw him spend steadily more and more on TV ads uh, to keep up with Clinton, suggest that it's not like now TV ads are a thing of the past. Um, but I think that the message that we, or a lesson that we did learn in this past election was, uh, and as you sort of just mentioned, the need to not disregard small donations. Um, what we saw in both the Democratic primary and in the general election was you know, Clinton would at least initially outraise Bernie Sanders, but a lot of it was coming from maxed out donations, checks of $2,700, while Bernie Sanders was consistently raising you know, millions of individual donations, uh, and he gradually began to surpass her in donations. Uh, then in the general election, Trump also was really successful among smaller donors, but was uh, continually lagging behind Clinton in how much he could raise from larger checks. So I think that the lesson that we can learn from both of those things is that it's such an important indicator of support, how many small donations you're getting. And I think that uh, going forward, candidates are going to need to not disregard that in their fundraising. Even if you can raise the same amount of money from fewer people, it's important to get that grassroots support. So, I, this is a departure from our script, but on our when we were pre preparing for this, we were talking about um, the importance of distinguishing between presidential campaigns and also congressional campaigns, which we'll be facing in the next two years. Um, do you see that? Do you think that uh, congressional campaigns will mirror what uh, will, will lag onto what Rebecca just said, or do you think it will depart in any ways? You talk about that from your experience on the Hill? Yeah. Um, you know, one of the interesting things about this past election is that even though 
it seems like it was a wave. You, you know, it was a, a shock to our political system. When it came to congressional elections, there wasn't really much change. Uh, there were a few seats that, uh, that flipped from uh, Republican to Democrat in the House and a couple in the Senate. Um, you know, small donors always are, and I, I do agree, they, they always are symbolic of the support that candidates, uh, the candidates have. But as we'll discuss, I think, throughout you know, the next few minutes, uh, big money does play a role, specifically in uh, Senate and uh, congressional campaigns where the dollar can go further. Um, you could have big money flooding the airwaves in some of these some of these elections, and that really plays a role. And that does have the tendency to drown out any small any small donors. So, you know, we're already in the 2018 cycle. Uh, you know, the minute one election ends, the next one starts. Uh, so we're already starting to see uh, positioning. We're starting to see uh, uh, entities form to not just take on 2018, but also 2020. Uh, uh, so, you know, we're out of one cycle, we're in another. In, in terms of reform, do you think that uh, Congress is a reliable source for us to, to seek reform? Okay, I'm gonna answer a different question. It's a trick <laughs> I learned in Congress. Um, uh, you know, throughout recent years, there have been many, many reform efforts uh, in Congress, and this sort of ties into uh, the question uh, that 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 Ian addressed: uh, Is this a partisan issue? Uh, yes, now it is. Uh, as 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 Nick had mentioned, I was on the Hill working for uh, Senator Schumer when Citizens United uh, was handed down. Uh, we put together the Disclose Act, uh, despite. Uh, several news reports, uh, there was a very strong attempt to make that bipartisan. Uh, there was numerous, numerous outreach efforts to many Republican offices, uh, because this is public, I'll say that one of those offices was Scott Brown, a uh, former senator from Massachusetts who uh, worked, with the, uh, worked with our office for many months on this. Um, in the end, uh, the vote was really primarily down partisan lines. Uh, in the House, I think there was one, it passed the House with, I think, one Republican member. Uh, in the Senate, it fell one vote short of breaking the filibuster. So what does that mean? That means 59 senators voted for the reform effort, 39 voted against. So given the, uh, the, the logic of Senate rules, even though 20 senators voted, 20 more senators voted for something, uh, it didn't pass. Um, because of that, we've seen you know repeated efforts for reform, but there has been one particular individual that has uh, stood up for some of these anti-reform efforts, and that's the current Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. Um, uh, Senator McConnell or Majority Leader McConnell engages in. Uh, uh, campaign finance issues. He looks at this as a very substantive issue. He believes that this is an issue that is controlled by the First Amendment. And he keeps his, his conference pretty well together on these issues, as evidenced by the fact that not one Republican senator voted for or was really willing to engage in serious discussions about, about the legislation. So I think, and, and Ian could probably address this, I think you see, you're starting to see some more of the reform efforts and issues be moved to the state level, moved to local levels, uh, where there might be some ability for public financing, for further disclosure. Uh, so at this point, you know, the, the reforms that we'll see out of Congress will more likely be those reforms that will uh, either lower contribution limits, uh, weaken uh, certain coordination rules between the political parties and the candidates, or allow for more money to be given to political parties. So not really the reform efforts that I think many folks in this room might have in mind, but that's probably what you're looking at. And you mentioned, mentioned a few things that I, I want to return to um, after talking to Kedrick. Uh, one of those things being the First Amendment and public financing, which we'll talk to you uh, in about. Um, Kedrick, we don't have a lot of confidence in Congress necessarily right now. Um, 
but you have been involved with the Office of Congressional Ethics, which has been in the news uh, recently. Um, what role do they play along with the FEC? And what role do we as citizens play in, in helping them to um, make sure that campaign finance rules are implemented? All right, sure. So uh, I'll first start with the Federal Election Commission. The role that the FEC is designed to play is to be able to regulate the limits of campaign contributions as well as the disclosure of uh, campaign contributions and to interpret various regulations that uh, apply to campaign finance law. The issue that you have now that is most relevant deals with the contributions or I should say independent expenditures from super PACs. So everyone is aware that super PACs mean that you have committees that are making independent expenditures. But the question becomes when is it independent versus when is it close enough to the campaign that it really is coordinated. It's a term of art, but basically that the campaign is controlling that expenditure. Because the FEC has not interpreted that, you do have super PACs who not only go to the line of what it means to be an independent expenditure, but can go past that. So what does that mean? If I ask you whether a independent expenditure was too close to a campaign uh, of a, uh, of a <coughs> candidate and I said the facts were that they used the same staff members at the super PAC that were used at the campaign uh, that they used the same vendor to create the uh, videos that they use the same video clips uh, that the person in charge is the parent of the campaign and that the majority of the contributions came from that parent you might say that that was close enough to be coordination well the FEC has not determine that in situations that are very similar to that. So to look at the FEC to uh, answer that question ha is to look at an entity that is not able to function because the commissioners are half Republicans, half Democrats. So enter the Office of Congressional Ethics. Uh, when I worked there, one reason that some members were not pleased with the organization is that we I can always say we, but that the entity um, read its jurisdiction to include not only ethical violations, so whether or not you have a conflict of interest as a member with uh, someone who is, is donating or something like that, but we would enforce campaign finance law and, and we even um, looked at situations where members were soliciting <coughs> campaign contributions from super PACs and to determine whether or not that uh, was a problem. Uh, Ultimately, I think the role of the OCE uh, has to be to continue to function as it has been functioning and hopefully to get even more power instead of what was tried uh, a few weeks ago to uh, reduce its power. A quick follow-up on that is, do you think that Congress did not eliminate uh, the office? Do you think that that is, though that it wasn't a priority at that time, do you think that it's still something that we as Americans should be concerned about? Y yes, people should be concerned about it. One interesting thing was that it was framed as uh, the priority of the members because they brought it first. I wouldn't necessarily say that it was a, their priority. The members who brought that amendment were smart enough to realize that typically the easiest way to take the power away from the OCE and ha not have it noticed is at, during the rules package process because there's so much that has to be approved in that initial vote that people wouldn't pay attention to it. They just, it was just a miscalculation. Uh, in another two years, the exact same thing will come up and people should be concerned and should watch for it. It will likely be more subtle, uh, but there, without a doubt, would be possibly uh, an attempt to uh, reduce its power. However, what I hope to see is a genuine conversation on how to improve the process. Uh, there are arguably some fair points on certain things that may uh, be improved with the process and we can have that conversation and then uh, have a debate that is outside of closed doors and come up with a uh, worthwhile solution. So I want to return to um, something that Jason was talking about since we're on the idea of alternatives and how to um, 
make this work. Could you talk a little bit about the First Amendment and what the Supreme Court said in Citizens United and where, where we're headed with that, and also the viability of public financing? Ian. Ian. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were talking. <laughs> sorry. Uh, sure. So, what the Supreme Court, uh, what the Supreme Court said in Citizens United, which which was an extension of the case from the '70s, was that it your First Amendment right to free speech includes the right to spend vast amounts of money on politics. Um, hopefully, the derisive way that I said that communicates that I don't agree. Um, uh, but specifically, I mean, Citizens United actually is kind of a it's kind of a weird thing in the law because the holding was actually very narrow. It was that corporations can spend out of their general treasury funds on independent expenditures, meaning not a direct donation to a candidate or a party. Um, but the reasoning of the decision was this vast sweeping, you know, uh, about the, how important speech is in a democracy, and we can't limit speech, and that's you know having the stormtroopers come to your door for um, <clears throat> what you say. But crucially also, the decision which was uh, written by Anthony Kennedy had two factual premises. Um, one, that the spending will be independent of the campaigns and therefore can't corrupt, right? I can't corrupt a candidate by giving an outside group $10 million to get that candidate elected because I'm not giving it to the candidate. So there's no corrupting uh, power whatsoever, right? That has, I mean, as Kedrick mentioned, the actual line of independence where the candidate can say to his or her chief of staff, go run this super PAC and use, use the same vendors that we're going to use and use the same ads that we're going to use. Like, of course, that can have exactly the same corrupting effect as a check directly to the candidate. And in fact, more so because you can only write a $2,700 check to a candidate, but you, write, you can write a $100 million check to the candidate's favorite super PAC. Uh, and then the second factual predicate was that it would all be disclosed. But what's actually happened um, is that there are these so-called dark money groups, which are nonprofits uh, set up under a portion of the tax code that was never meant to be involved in elections at all. Um, that uh, spend money on elections and again because of uh, failure to enforce it, the FEC and the IRS um, are allowed to spend their entire budgets on elections uh, without any <coughs> disclosure or contribution limits whatsoever. Um, so uh, given that constitutional structure which says because of this s supposed free speech interest in spending huge amounts of money we can't limit the amount that the fabulously wealthy can uh, give to politicians, um, the reform groups have come at it from the other direction, which is to say, let's just take away politicians, well, politicians who so desire, take away their appetite or their need for these vast amounts of money by helping to pay for campaigns with public financing. Um, and the model that the Brennan Center supports uh, is a model that amplifies and multiplies small donations by saying, okay, if you can raise um, money in small amounts from people who will be your constituents, um, the a public funding, a grant from the government will match that uh, and multiply it um, at some ratio, six to one, five to one, whatever, so that a $100 check from a regular person become is added to a $600 check from the public finance fund <clears throat> And then candidates can run campaigns without either being fabulously wealthy or having fabulously wealthy friends or uh, sucking up to fabulously wealthy people who want things from them. Um, and that is a, that's a reform that has been successful for decades in New York City and a few other places and uh, is being expanded at the, state, at the state level. We're seeing more and more interest uh, in the states. In fact, South Dakota, a very red state, uh, just recently passed a public finance, a slightly different model of, of public financing. <clears throat> Did anybody have something to add? Yeah, um, if I can just add to what you said about super PACs, I think one of the other crazy ways we saw these candidates get around the rules in this past election was launching a super PAC before you actually began your candidacy. So Jeb Bush spent six months fundraising for his super PAC. He raised almost $100 million 
and then said he was running for president. Uh, and this, under in the FEC's eyes, I guess, is legal because they didn't do anything about it. Um, so that was another way that this idea that by giving to a super PAC, you're completely separate from the candidate is kind of a bogus idea. Um, the other thing we saw that sort of bent the rules was this new style of having multiple super PACs for a candidate, each belonging to an individual donor family. So Ted Cruz was one of the first people to do this model. Rick Perry also did it. Uh, and basically, the way it would work is Cruz had four different super PACs. Each one was bankrolled by a different wealthy family, uh, for example, the Mercers, who are now supporting Trump. Uh, those donors then had full control over how their money was spent. They got to approve everything that happened before it was done. And in the case of Rick Perry in particular, if the candidate dropped out, they got all their money back. Uh, so it's just another illustration of how these donors have a direct line to the candidate. So along that, we see, uh, along that line, we see that campaign finance is directly tied to <clears throat> political elections and even larger to political parties. Um, wh what do you see the future of political parties being in light of uh, campaign finance? So they've been weakened. Um, you know, it's hard to sit here and listen to Ian and Rebecca and not see really how they've been weakened. If I'm a donor, and I've got a lot of money, um, and I can set up my own super PAC, or I can give $10 million to a super PAC set up by Kedrick, um, to really support my candidate and be under my control, that's really appealing. That's a lot more appealing than writing a $33,000 check to the DNC or the RNC and then not really knowing where that money is going to, not knowing if that's going to go to your candidate of choice. So whereas in the, the good old days, uh, the DNC, the RNC, and then the, the, the Senate and House candidate committees were the alternative vehicles other than the, the, the candidates committee itself, you now have a whole menu of different opportunities. I can give to four or five different super PACs. I can give to various dark money groups. And the benefit there is, Kedrick will talk about, um, I think in a couple minutes, is if I give to a dark money group, um, as you know, it's clear by the title, I'm not disclosed. If I give to a super PAC, I am disclosed. So that's a whole other option for somebody that might be embarrassed or just not want to be associated with a particular campaign. Um, all of these place the parties in a very difficult position. Um, this really was evident after Citizens United. We saw, uh, we meaning the entire country, saw the rise of uh, corporate and, you know, Citizens United did allow uh, independent union money in elections as well. And that had the ability to flood out the political parties. And, you know, it's, it's interesting and I'd be curious to hear what, what everyone else thinks. Um, you know, there was a lot of talk this cycle about the control the parties had over the uh, candidates during the primary. There was discussion about the DNC and whether they were treating Bernie Sanders fairly or unfairly. There was also discussion about the RNC and how it was maybe blindsided by Donald Trump taking control of the party. Um, you know, query whether these, these alternative spending vehicles help make that happen, uh, help make uh, the parties just another player rather than the controlling player. Um, moving forward, the, the parties will still be around. Um, they will still have control, uh, but they now have to compete, which places them in a, in a uh, somewhat awkward position. Yeah, if I could add a wrinkle to that, I mean, it, it's definitely true that the, the ecosystem is more complicated, but it's, it's all a version of this independence issue that Kedrick was already talking about also happens at the party level, right? Where uh, Mitch McConnell and uh, formerly Harry Reid, I'm sure Chuck Schumer will do a great job at this, um, had their former chiefs of staff set up super PACs and dark money groups uh, that were staffed up by party operatives. And so, you know, you have the situation where the party committee is becoming more anemic because, in part, because they are raising bigger money through their affiliated super PACs, which raised 
a strong majority of their money in million dollar plus checks. Um, so, you know, it's this kind of weird situation where, yes, the parties are getting weakened where if you look at the party committee, but then there's this sort of other thing that's like the party plus the glommed on super PACs that actually has these vast amounts of money, but, but is, I think, I think, uh, even more sort of beholden to a tiny group of mega donors than the party, which is supposed to be this big, small d democratic thing. <clears throat> yeah, and, and just to build on that, I think another way that the parties have been able to deal with this, um, you know, another Supreme Court case, we're just throwing them out there, uh, that, that built off of Citizens United was a case called McCutcheon. Uh, what McCutcheon did was it essentially said that uh, aggregate limits, so aggregate limits were unconstitutional. So what I mean by that is, you know, we're limited in how much money we can give to a particular candidate. Um, there were also limits in how much money per election cycle I can give to the parties. And the Supreme Court had held that there really is no threat of corruption there. So it struck down those limits. So what does that mean? That means if I wanted to give a million dollars and break that up to the various political parties, the campaign committees, the candidates, I'm able to do that now. In the past, the limit was around $100,000. So as a result, what you've seen happen, as many people predicted, was the rise of uh, these more or less jumbo joint fundraising committees where pass-through campaign vehicles were set up and they had various constituent committees. So now for a $100,000 check, for a $1 million check, you could go to a particular fundraiser that might give you uh, a more intimate setting with a particular candidate or party officials. And then that pass-through vehicle, those in charge of it, would then divide that money up uh, amongst the various constituent committees. That's one of the ways the parties have been able to deal with this new rise of big money that doesn't involve so much the super PACs, but keeps it within the party apparatus. Let, let me point this out, and I hope you all are seeing this. This is, uh, this is something I hear somewhat whispered in DC, but I think it's going to be a possible lead to reform. What we're talking about here are all the different ways that people have to, have to give large amounts of money and the competition between the party and the super PAC. And you have all of these different buckets. What you have to understand, and this is really on the congressional level, is that you don't have donors going through the phone book trying to see who can I donate to. All right? You have all these different entities, the uh, uh, Joint Fundraising Committee, the super PAC, the party, all of them are calling the donors, that same small amount of donors who can make these contributions. To give you an idea of how many calls are going on, right now in January, as the new members come to Congress, you've probably heard that they have their orientation. At the orientation, they are told, it's time to start getting reelected. To start getting reelected, you need to uh, raise, and one figure uh, that was reported says $18,000 per day. That's what you need to be doing, calling people who can get you up to $18,000 $18, per day. So if you miss a day, you need to find a wealthy donor. What that means is that you're going to have donors, particularly when I say donors, I'm no longer talking about wealthy individuals. I'm talking about uh, PACs, these corporate PACs, these lobbyists who actually have interest before these members, getting called repeatedly. And one thing they cannot do is what they did when I was in private practice as a lawyer advising these clients, and that's called a lawyer to get out of it. And what I mean by that is when I worked at a firm, uh, sometimes the, and most of the clients were Wall Street banks, who were, uh, had their PACs that were being uh, asked to contribute, they would like a letter from the lawyer saying that they had maxed out. They legally cannot give any more money. They can't say that anymore. So what happens is they're asked to give that uh, campaign contribution that goes to the, the campaign, just a regular PAC. Then they're asked to give it to the super PAC. Then they're asked to the joint fundraising committee. And then if they say, well, you know what, we don't want to be on record given this much money. No problem, we can help you with that. We had this dark money group, do you want to support? What do you say? Do you say as a, 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 a donor? No. It would be difficult to say no. But then, as a business, and you're looking at your return on investment, if you're giving more money, 
Are you, is there a return on investment of giving more money? It may happen that you will start to have more lobbyists going to the OCE and at trying to uh, have some type of hmm, enforcement is hard to enforce things that are legal, but some type of uh, restrictions on this or try to push for some type of uh, laws because if they're not seeing the benefit of giving more money to people who are raising $18,000 per day, that's going to be a concern. You've thrown out a few terms, and I want to make sure that we're um, explaining the difference between dark money, super PACs, PACs. Could you talk a little bit about that and, and how that changes things? Yeah, I mean, just, just and, and Ian, I th think you touched on this earlier, but the main thing is that a, a, we call it super PAC, but it's an independent expenditure only committee. That is a committee that reports to the Federal Election Commission and routinely reports everybody who donates and every money, every bit of money that is spent, regulated by the Federal Election Commission. Even though the FEC, I told you, uh, is not making various decisions, their website is still working. So you see things reported, and all that is, is, is there, and that's public. A dark money group is a social welfare organization, a 501c4. The Independent Expenditure Only Committee is 527. But anyway, 501c4, they don't have to report their donors because it's regulated under tax law. It is not uh, it, on the uh, FEC. However, the dark money group contributes that money to the uh, uh, super PAC. And all you see is that it came from this uh, organization. Also, you have LLCs that are starting to give contributions, and you don't know who uh, is contributing there. So that also is part of the dark money. So overall, you have all of these buckets of money, uh, and it, it's not getting uh, better. Now, Rebecca, as we go into the appointments phase and um, Congress is vetting Trump's different appointments, how are we seeing campaign finance contributions playing a role, if at all? Well, I think one of the most interesting things to look at lately has been, uh, I mean, to start, Trump has nominated a lot of people who made major donations to his campaign or party or various super PACs to serve in his administration. On top of that, what you're seeing is that a lot of these nominees have given a lot of money historically to the senators who are now going to be running their confirmation hearings. And on top of that, you have a lot of the lawmakers that Trump has appointed to run uh, to serve in his administration have historically either served on the committees that are going to be charged with confirming them or have given through their leadership packs hundreds of thousands of dollars to the senators on those committees. Uh, a leadership pack is something, it's connected to a lawmaker, it's typically used, uh, it pays for things that are not related to a campaign or to their official services, and it's frequently used just to curry favor with your colleagues in Congress by donating to them in their re-election years. So I think that's been a really fascinating thing. For example, Betsy DeVos, the nominee to serve as education secretary, uh, has given, I think, with her family, $250,000 to the senators tasked with confirming her. Uh, Jeff Sessions, who just had his confirmation hearing this week, had through his leadership pack given to, I think, seven of the eight other senators, uh, other Republican senators on the committee. So I think campaign finance continues to be a pretty key issue to look at. So if you have these people influencing politicians, um, and at the same time, campaign finance seems to be in tension with political parties. Uh, is the two-party political system in having an existential crisis, or is it is it here to stay? All right, I drew the short straw on that one. Um, I, I think it's here to say uh, to stay. Um, you know, I we will see you know third-party candidates uh, pop up from time to time, uh, but. Generally, the two-party system will be here to stay. You know, they've changed. You know, the Republican Party of today is not the same of the Republican Party 70 years ago or earlier than that. So you will see various ideological shifts in the parties. Um, I think you've seen one with the Republican Party very recently. Um, but I think it is here to stay. Um, the, the idea that there will be a third party that will take and you know, remain in the system. Um, and 
yes, there is the Green Party, there is the Libertarian Party, and, and they make a difference. Uh, I mean, you know, I was at this law school uh, for Bush v. Gore, so I, you know, remember how Ralph Nader and the Green Party made a difference there. Uh, but I, I think that some of the obstacles that are being posed to the parties, I think, are even greater for the rise of a, of, of a third party that consistently plays in our elections. Yeah, I, I just, oh, go ahead. I, I just quickly point out that, I mean, sometimes when you think about an existential crisis, you think about whether or not the, the, the party is breaking apart. And I just say that within the last year, the Republican Party, if you ask this question just last year about the Republican Party, like February during the primary, it's like, oh my goodness, Republican Party is all over the place. They uh, support various candidates. And then when uh, the primary was over and Donald Trump was the uh, uh, nominee, then it still looked as though the, the party was divided. What I'm seeing now, uh, and you see it on television with the uh, high, high officials, but also I'm seeing it with the, uh, the staffers in D.C. The people who were Republicans before who were like, I don't agree with Trump, are now clamoring to get into the administration. So the party is now unifying. Uh, so I, I don't think it's evidence of uh, an existential crisis there. And with the Democrats, I feel as though they're waiting. It won't start to even, waiting until this time next week, well, next Friday, to see that once President Obama leaves, what is the party? Who's the leader? Who emerges as the leader? And then um, also do Republicans implode? Uh, so I think there's a lot of waiting going on now. Yeah, I just wanted to add, if you just, if you just look at money, so we did a study looking at um, the spending in the, you know, the 10 competitive Senate races in 2016. Uh, one of the, another thing that Citizens United said about out, this independent spending is, oh, this, is, this brings new voices into the system. Like anybody can just come in and, and spend money. This will sort of open up the marketplace of ideas. But actually what has happened to this outside money ecosystem is the parties through these groups, these super PACs that are sort of connected to the party leaders actually control the majority of the money in the outside system. So um, <clears throat> the party committees, their associated super PACs, and their associated dark money groups, those and the two major parties, that accounts for most of the outside of the non-candidate spending in the system. So in a sense, we sort of opened up this outside money system with no limits, but the parties actually pretty quickly came and, and sort of took over and said, okay, give, give us the money and we'll farm it out to these candidates. So I think they're evolving in a way that will ensure their survival uh, going forward. Yeah, I, I would just add, I think you need one of these big donors to support a third party candidate if they're really going to be viable. You saw Gary Johnson raise pretty incredible amounts of money for a third party candidate, but it still wasn't enough. And like you said, a lot of big donors did rally behind Trump towards the end of the election. But there were a couple of big Republicans who stayed on the sidelines, like Paul Singer and Ken Griffin, both of whom had supported Rubio earlier in the campaign. And they didn't look to one of these third party candidates. The Kochs also didn't spend any money in the presidential election. And so I think that barrier of not having any of those guys be willing to get behind one of these third party candidates is going to block them from growing. Rebecca, I want to stay on you because throughout the panel I've heard a few gasps and a few responses from the audience. Um, I'm wondering, are people interested in this because it seems like a topic that really affects us? Um, and what do you think the, the role of the media is in getting this story out and making more Americans aware? I like to think that people are interested in this. Um, I think what we saw over the course of the campaign that was really interesting was both Clinton and Trump's supporters were both really interested in campaign finance. And at least initially, Trump's people said one of the things that they liked about him was the fact that he was self-funding, that he didn't have super PACs, that he wasn't reliant on all these big donors. When he turned that around, they didn't really seem to care as much anymore, but it was at least one of the factors that seemed to draw them to him initially. So I think in terms of what role the media can play in this, as you guys have pointed out, all this information is public. It's all on the FEC website, but it's certainly not easy to digest. And so I think that uh, being able to look at these reports from the campaigns now for the nominees and the senators confirming them and make it more easily accessible, I think that's the most important role right now. I agree with that, that the role of the media is going to be very important because one thing that you hear 
uh, people talk about if they are opposed to the current system of campaign finance is that we need to overturn Citizens United, overturn Citizens United. I don't know if they understand that if you overturn Citizens United, as Ian said, that's a very narrow holding. You still have super PACs. You can still have super PACs and take away the fact that a corporation can make independent expenditures. You can still have the wealthy individuals making uh, these huge independent expenditures. So people need to understand the complexity of it all, and it probably it's going to be up to the media to do that. Yeah, and and just just to tie it in, you know, when we look at these holdings and when people think of Citizens United, I mean, one of the key statements in that. Uh, in that holding that I think really draws outrage from people of all political stripes is the idea that independent spending can never corrupt. So that means that, I mean, and, and I think this is what draws outrage and I think this is why people care. That means if I give Kedrick $5,000 directly, I exchange the money to him and he's running for Senate, he'd be a good senator. And that was above the limit that could be corruption. However, if I take a check, write it out for $10 million and buy airtime in favor of his candidacy, that, according to the Supreme Court, can never <coughs> corrupt. And I think that that's what Americans care about. Um, I, I'm not in touch with all Americans, but I would think that they care about, I know I care about a system that is fair, a system that is, is, is honest, and I think that when people see this type of, these types of pronouncements and people acting on it, I think it draws outrage. And I think that, you know, boiling down specific examples that Rebecca and, 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 and others do in the media, I think is important, both the good and the bad. Like what's working, what's not working in our system. That's what gets people to care about. You know, you don't want this just, you know, boiled down into one tagline, overturn Citizens United. Because it's, it's not that easy. You know, the, the odds of that happening are very, very rare. Um, even rarer post-election. But there are fixes that could be made that would satisfy everyone on, on, on every side of this issue. Um, that can really talk about the definition of corruption, that can work to improve that, that nexus there. So now that everyone in, in this room is aware, um, what steps can we take um, to get involved in this, in this movement or get involved in holding uh, Congress accountable? I think I'm supposed I'm to answer that question. Well, if you're a law student, you can intern at the Brennan Center. Um, or lots of other organizations that work on money and politics. But I mean, as I think other people have said in this portion of the prior panels, um, <clears throat> you know, your, your elected officials control the law and policy in this area. And all of these crazy irrational things that we've been describing can all be fixed with legislation, regulation, uh, same uh, court decisions. Um, so, you know, you should be talking to your elected officials at all levels, including the local uh, municipal level, and certainly in Congress. Um, people should be paying a price for, because, you know, these elected officials are, they got into office under the current system and they don't want those rules to change. And, you know, they know they can protect their friends, their, the special interests that got them there. Um, and they should pay a political price for that. Uh, everybody should be on board with um, uh, holding elected officials accountable for not fixing these problems. You know, as I said at the outset, vast majorities of Americans agree that this is a problem. Um, but some of those same polls show that vast majorities of Americans also think that it's a problem you can't solve because we're all so cynical about the power of money. Um, but votes counted together are actually more powerful than money, as, as you know, sort of consistently um, we see shining examples of here and there in every election cycle, whether it's like Bernie Sanders, um, or David Cantor uh, getting beat by someone who had no money. Um, so, uh, Eric Cantor, sorry. Um, so, you know, Give money in small amounts to elected officials who care about these issues. Tell your elected officials to care about these issues. Uh, work with reform groups. Like these are all things that any citizen can do, and certainly um, 
attorneys are, uh, and especially uh, enfranchised uh, group in society to, to, to take, this, take these kinds of stands? Um, so first of all, I would say subscribe to the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> um, <laughs> second, uh, I think what we've seen with Trump so far is that more than previous presidents, he appears really affected by what he reads about himself and what he sees about himself on cable television. I think you saw that with the effort to close the Office of Congressional Ethics. He then tweeted saying that that shouldn't be a priority. This is obviously a simplistic way of looking at it, but I think that making a fuss about things that are concrete, he, he does appear to sometimes respond to that, and I think that having as much attention drawn to an issue as possible will help. Yes, I agree. And I, I think there are many ways you can get involved and make a difference. We started talking about the presidential election, and that's the type of election that gets the uh, most attention. But as Ian said, it is about looking locally. And your day-to-day -day is probably uh, more influenced by your local government, whether that's the mayor, city council, or the state. As a result, people are, are, are noticing this, and they're organized to do something. I think of one organization is Represent.us, uh, and they have started a campaign to go state by state to get approved certain anti-corruption uh, legislation and, and just trying to do it at the state level, and they've been successful. I also was in Washington, D.C. yesterday at the announcement of a new initiative by uh, um, Eric Holder uh, that the President, President Obama, is going to also be involved in called the National Democratic Redistricting Committee. And that is focused on going to cities and, st and, and states and getting elect elected officials who can then make state policy and state laws that over time will uh, uh, influence the presidential election. So you have to think long term, and people are trying to think the long game and not just try to show up every uh, four years and make a difference. Well, I can't be, you know, buying the Wall Street Journal or, or donating to the Brennan Center. But, you know, I, I think there is a common theme that the organizers of, of this conference did such a really good job about and that's you know there are many many opportunities to get involved uh, you know we heard about voting rights we heard about criminal justice we heard about national security issues there are you know not to give you competition but there are many many groups out there where they need people you know pounding the pavement and getting out there uh, not just with contributions but volunteering on an issue that you find near and dear. Um, that does matter. Um, you know, obviously money in the system is important, and I, I think we, we, we all agree on that. But, you know, volunteering for campaigns, um, working in legal protection hotlines, um, you know, uh, uh, volunteering, you know, for, for government jobs or, or working in government jobs, volunteering for, for nonprofits. I mean, these are all ways that you can actually combat uh, big money in the system. Um, I, I think that, you know, bringing attention to these issues uh, I think is important. Um, and really focusing on, you know, those issues that you might feel threatened um, or those issues that you want to advance. Um, that's a way to do it, and it's not really a zero-sum game, just because maybe opposition to the issue or a particular candidate uh, that opposes your, your issues raising tens of millions of dollars, and all's not lost. I think that there's a way to get out there and a way to, uh, way to try to combat that. Great. Well, we have a few questions, and I encourage folks to continue to write questions down. Um, Someone in the audience wants to talk a little bit about class and says, isn't this really a class issue, not a partisan politics issue? Republicans and Democrats raise a lot of money the same, in, in the same way. Um, what role does class play? Um, I, I mean, I think that's true. It, you know, if, I think it was 2014 that we passed this, mon this milestone of having a Congress that's majority, a majority of members of Congress are millionaires. Or, or richer. Um, and if you look at who runs for office, it tends to be um, people from uh, 
higher class backgrounds. And there, you know, there's political science evidence that people just think differently based on their class. And um, what comes out, the products that come out of government sort of protect the interests of higher class people at the expense of low income people. Um, and that, you know, I think there are multiple avenues for that. One, certainly one of them is campaign finance and just the need for money and the need to raise money and the need to know how to pick up the phone for hours a day and call people and raise your $18,000 a day. Um, and, you know, th that's why, so that interrupts the ideal of democracy, which is that our representatives in government work for us, not some weird subset of us. Um, and the best reforms uh, are designed to sort of provide a way around that. Like public financing allows someone who's like a cop or a community organizer to run and fund a campaign without having to make those phone calls to the richest people, uh, you know, in Wall Street or whatever. Um, and so, I, and that is that's not that's not partisan. Nothing I just nothing I just said is partisan. Nothing about that is a left-right issue. It's about the people in power should represent the people. <clears throat> uh, one question is: Is there any documented evidence of corruption of a public official um, receiving a direct benefit from a donor, or vice versa? And what does that look like um, from the Office of Congressional Ethics? And let me make sure I understand it. Uh, evidence of a... Is there any evidence of corruption? And what does that look like? <laughs> <laughs> there is evidence of corruption. Um, okay, okay. I'll, I'll bring up a few <laughs> examples. Just, just a few? Yes. Let's yes. make it a longer panel. Um, so there's a prohibition on giving campaign contributions tied to an official act. Can't do that. Uh, one investigation we, we had was around earmarks. And earmarks now, after our investigations, uh, are no longer, um, well, there's a moratorium. That, I wonder if that may, that may change. So in the day of earmarks, what that means is that you would have a company that will want a government contract. So for example, you are a, um, a company that builds computers. You want a contract with the federal government to build those computers for multiple facilities. To get the contract, you make contributions to the member of Congress. So the member who's in charge of writing that earmark for your company. So it says give a um, million dollars to ABC Corporation. That's the law, you get it. What we found was that we asked the members, how are you making these decisions on the earmarks? Well, they say, well, look, we're, we're not doing this based on the campaign contribution or anything like that. But then we went and saw the records of the companies. They would have a spreadsheet that would say, we're gonna give this contribution to this member to get this earmark. And it was just written out that that was the entire plan. Now, clearly, the members can say that they didn't know that chart existed. But that is illegal on this part of the person who donated uh, the money. That's, that's, that's one example. But uh, we found quite a bit more when it comes to the connection with the solicitation for the campaign contribution and what the um, person donating the money wants to have. I mean, I, I would just say, you know, maybe it depends on what your sort of burden of proof is. Uh, there have definitely been times when people went to jail because they took a campaign contribution and promised somebody official action. Like, that has happened in American history. Um, there have been vastly many more examples where you see somebody took a campaign contribution and then the person who gave got some benefit and you can't ever quite put them in the same room and say, okay, there's a spreadsheet that says, I hereby give X bribe to, um, you know, so there's a lot more of those that raise uh, suspicions or appearances of corruption or there's a conflict of interest, uh, you know, where the average person, I think, putting myself in 
the mindset of the average person, um, would say, something fishy is going on here. I didn't get the chance to get that billion dollar state contract, uh, but you know, the governor's donors did. Um, so you know, there are innumerable, innumerable examples of that. <clears throat> and I would just say it's, it's not limited to campaigns or super PACs either. One of the big issues in the campaign was uh, Hillary Clinton's foundation and money that it took while she was Secretary of State. So one instance that we looked at was she intervened uh, in a matter on behalf of UBS and UBS then hired her husband for a, uh, I think something like 10 speeches totaling millions of dollars. Their uh, contributions to the foundation went like this. It, there's so many instances like that where there's an action and there's a donation and you don't necessarily have the smoking gun of the email saying this is why we're giving, but there, you know, there's, it's very circumstantial. Uh, this, is a, this is a question that really caught my eye. Senator Cory Booker recently was criticized by Democrats and Republicans for being in the pocket of Big Pharma as they donated a nominal amount to his campaign. For anyone, it was, was $200,000, I think. <clears throat> for anyone considering running, aside from the facts of Cory Booker, for anyone considering running for public office, how do you appear independent of contributions when uh, contributions are reality, uh, the, the cost of campaigns are reality? Um, that's what members have, have told us when we were doing uh, investigations. So I'll give one example, and, and, and I guess that'll show the uh, dilemma that some members are, are, are in. We were investigating the appearance of corruption when a campaign contribution is tied with an official act and in this particular circumstance, it was when members of Congress were soliciting campaign contributions from Wall Street banks on the same day that they were voting on Wall Street reform. The question is, is that an appearance? Not a violation, but does that appear as though the campaign contribution is tied to that vote? Some type of way this investigation was front page of uh, the newspaper uh, and it, it, when it was still going on. Democrats and Republicans were outraged because this comes up. If we're supposed to raise money, why would I not solicit a campaign contribution from a lobbyist who cares about what I'm doing? And I cannot be responsible for the time of the vote. I didn't know the vote was going to be on that particular day. What am I supposed to do? It was ruled that once we found all the facts, and the facts included how the uh, members hired fundraisers, and the fundraisers then went to the lobbyists to have them raise money, and we saw the emails when the lobbyists were asking for more money the day before uh, the vote, that that was not the appearance of corruption. So the, the, the point is, legally, there is no, there would be no problem with that, and you can run for office the way the law is now, and uh, solicit those campaign contributions uh, whenever you want in any amount, and that's okay. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the premise of the question makes a good point. It's like the money has to come from somewhere. If you raise a million dollars and 100,000 came from X industry, can you never vote on that industry again? Um, you know, uh, <laughs> not to be the dead horse about public campaign, financing, but that's the problem with the pri privately financed uh, system is you're always potentially going to have gotten money from somebody who has an interest uh, in some vote, potentially a very direct pecuniary interest. Um, and the, you know, it, it it, there's, a, there's always this sort of psych, you know, pop psychology question where <coughs> members will always tell you, well, I didn't take that vote because I got $3,000 from that donor. Uh, I don't know that people can really know that about themselves, and there's plenty of empirical evidence that actually people can be swayed by r s surprisingly small amounts of money. You know, these studies on doctors where they like give them a pen with some drug name on it. And the doctors were like, I don't care about that pen. And then you look at how, what they prescribed, and the doctors with the pens, sure enough, prescribed like 
20% more of that drug, even though it's more expensive and has X more side effects. Like, there are real reasons to think that even, you know, small amounts of money, like $200,000, can sway somebody in ways that even that person doesn't subjectively know about. And, and and all that is beside the point of what you said, which is this appearance of, you know, it just looks bad. Even if you're, everybody is totally above board and it's all a coincidence, it still looks bad. And we're supposed to have a government that we believe in, that we have confidence in, that we have faith is representing us and not some check writing pharmacy company. And this will be our final question. Um, and this might be best directed to Rebecca. Um, do you have a guess? or data on how much Trump actually spent out of his own funds for the campaign. And to raise that to another level is, um, is there a threat of wealthy individuals surpassing super PACs, surpassing political parties, and running for office on their own funds? Well, I think what you saw with Trump is that he talked a big game about how much he was going to give to his campaign, but his, his actual giving fell far short of that. And I'm trying to remember the exact number. I think it was 67 million was the total that he gave to his campaign. So less than the 100 million he said he would give. Uh, and he also, over the course of the campaign, directed $10 million back to his own companies. Um, so that included paying his hotels, paying his golf courses, paying his airline. Uh, I think his airline got the most money, something like $7 million. Um, so to the second part of the question, whether there's this threat of wealthy people running more often for office. I think, as I said earlier, a big appeal of Trump was that he was this rich guy uh, who didn't need wealthy donors, who could pay his own way. And uh, just going back also to the class question, what was so interesting about his campaign was that he directed his message to these working class Americans, and working class Americans are who elected him. For you know, we, He saw, got a lot of support from them. Uh, and now we have a billionaire who's president who has appointed an unprecedented con concentration of fellow millionaires and billionaires to serve in his administration. Um, I don't know if that changes voters' opinions on what having a billionaire run for president looks like going forward. Maybe the idea that because someone's rich and runs for president means that they're not beholden to other rich people is somewhat reduced by what's happened so far, but it's hard to say. Great. Well, could we please give our panelists a round of applause? <laughs> now, I know that I am the person that is between you and drinks, but if you'll indulge me for just a few moments, um, I want to do a few housekeeping moments. Uh, announcements. First, um, for all those who are seeking CLE and have not um, completed the registration process, there is a CLE table um, at the front lobby upstairs. Um, as I alluded to, there is a wonderful cocktail reception in the Great Hall um, that's west of here, but for those of you who are direction challenged like me, we'll have some people to help you direct, direct you there. And finally, on behalf, um, this symposium has been Fantastic, but we could not have done it without the help of a lot of people. So if I could have my fellow Toll Scholars come down. There are a few people we'd like to recognize, one being Lauren Leagy out of the Toll Public Interest Center. She always, come on down. she always had a smile on her face, and today, to encourage us, she told each of us that our panel was the best, and she was looking forward to it, so <laughs> it, it helped. Uh, next, we could not have done any of this without the wonderful help of Hillary Rizelle. She always provided us amazing bagels at 8 a.m. in the morning. She always had a smile on her face and sent us uh, reminder emails that helped us to get all of this stuff accomplished. <laughs> and then last but not least, we have to thank uh, our fearless leader, Arlene 
uh, Robert Finkelstein, who is the life of the Toll Public Interest Center and the life of Penn Law in a lot of ways. Uh, she really helped us to transform this symposium into a divisive event, into something that was really, um, that we think really brought people together. So thank you, Arlene, come on down. And a few other folks, we want to thank all the people from Jay Lask who have been walking the aisles, who are at the tables uh, taking photos. Thank you for all your help. And also to our uh, other Toll Scholars in the class of 2019 and the class of 2017. Thank you for your example and also for your support. And with that, we thank you.